Good afternoon, everyone. I want to let everyone know that we will be beginning at 1 p.m. Um, we are currently going to be in listen-only mode. Um, just for a bit of housekeeping, I want to let everyone know on the right-hand side, um, this is where you'll find uh, the ability to type in your questions. And we also have handouts from today's presentation. So we will, beginning at, we will be beginning the presentation at 1 p.m. Once again, for the presentation, we will be in listen-only mode. You'll have the ability to type in your questions on the right-hand side. In addition, we have the handouts from today's presentation on the right-hand side for you to use at your convenience. We will begin at 1, and until then, we will be, uh, again, on mute. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to Care Connection, the free live webinar. Today, we have a very special guest speaker. Her name is Dr. Dori Sabata. She's an occupational therapist and clinical assistant professor at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Additionally, Dr. Sabata is the program director of the American Stroke Foundation. For more than 20 years, her work has focused on providing families options to support aging in place. Today's topic will be recognizing home hazards and possible home modifications for safety. Before we begin, I just want to let everyone know that this presentation is in listen-only mode. You could type in your questions and concerns or comments at the, uh, towards the end of the presentation on the right-hand side. Additionally, on the right-hand side, you will find handouts from today's presentation and from AFA. Without further ado, I'd like to have a warm welcome for Dr. Dori Sabata. 
Thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'm, I'm not able to see the questions that you have, but please do enter those and um, I, I will, they will be letting me know what those questions are and I'm happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, I also wanted to let you know that um, while I'm an occupational therapist and a professional, um, Alzheimer's and dementia is um, close to me as well. And um, many of the reasons I went into occupational therapy is because of the relationship that I had with my grandmother. And um, my grandmother had a stroke and near the end of her life was um, showing signs of dementia and it was probably a vascular dementia. But um, dementia and Alzheimer's is certainly something that I understand from, from a personal perspective as well as a professional one. Um, so one of the things that happens um, with a disease like Alzheimer's or dementia is that often a person, right now we don't have medical interventions to be able to, to improve conditions. And uh, we can expect that the physical things that are happening to a person um, are, are probably going to decline. But from my perspective as an occupational therapist, we're interested also in what's that interaction with the environment. Um, and so my interest in the home environment is, is how can we keep people as active and involved as possible for as long as possible by creating a supportive environment and a safe environment for people to continue to do the things that are important to them. So that's why the, this topic is really important to me. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some ways to recognize safety hazards around the home and, and look for things that, that you could do to simplify the environment. And I'm going to introduce some different tools that you might use. And I'm also going to um, give you some ideas of some simple home uh, sample home modifications. So I like to start with, with a photo. I think photos are really um, helpful. And I'd like you to just take a second and look at the things that you can just see, just observing. Um, and I, I love this photo. This was a friend of mine who took this photo. This was not staged. This was just people living life. Um, and it has some really concerning things about it. Uh, most of you might notice that there's only one handrail. And so the care partner is having to su support the older person getting down the steps. Um, there's probably some room for some education with with this pair um, in terms of their positioning where where um, they're both positioned is probably not optimal they probably need to be on the same step instead of two different steps um, the depth of the steps is different so having to figure out how how big of a step to take um, is is something that might be concerning here the contrast so if there's any difficulty kind of seeing where the edge of the step is. Um, there's a mat at the top and a mat at the bottom, but that middle step, it might be hard to tell where where the edge of that stops and starts. And it also looks like these steps might be painted. So you can imagine if that um, if it was raining and that was slick, that would probably not, not be a good situation. And then there happens to be this hose on the corner. It seems to be out of the way, but you never know if you could get caught up in that. Um, and there's a walker at the bottom, but it doesn't appear to be open and ready for the, the person to use once they're at the bottom. It's kind of almost in the way of where she needs to step. And then lastly, we're so busy and we're trying to be efficient. Um, the, the daughter in this picture has a, a blue handle in her hand. I don't know if you can see that very well. And the string that's going off the page, um, she's actually taking the dog out. So if you can imagine, we can't really see the size of that dog, but if that dog pulled her, they are going to be a little domino effect where the daughter falls on her mother and the mother falls on her on her walker. Um, and there's lots of problems going on here. And just in this one picture, the other thing we the other things that we might think about, um, this is daylight and it's not raining or there's no kind of weather that we need to be concerned about. Um, there appears to be an overhead light, so maybe at night there would at least be some lighting there. We don't know what that looks like. We also don't really know, um, just from this picture, you know, whose house is this? Is this, um, who, you know, is this 
is this where they live and they're used to going um, up and down these steps frequently or are they visiting someone? Um, so that, that may also play into how well they're able to manage these steps. So I hope that gives you some things to think about as we kind of move through this. So I want to talk a little bit about assessment. Um, and assessments can help us do a lot of things. It can help us determine what some solutions might be. It might help us identify what, what some problems are so that we can get to those solutions. And um, in particular, I'm looking at, at the home environment and what are those kinds of um, technologies or equipment or modifications that we could make to the home or things that, that we could educate the caregiver about or support the caregiver or care partner uh, in, in these instances um, because we're, we're not trying to improve the disease process. And then also minimizing some of that burden. And lastly, um, there may be some opportunities for um, a home assessment, a professional home assessment to be paid for by an insurance company. And so um, some, some of that assessment may help to document um, what is needed for that. And typically that would probably be in home health. If someone was receiving home health, they might get a home safety assessment. Occasionally that might be true if someone has had a hospitalization and they're getting ready to go home from the hospital, they may want to determine um, what the home environment is like and if it's safe for, for them to return before they discharge them from the hospital. So those might be some instances where that occurs. So who can do assessments? Well, um, anybody, anybody can do, there's different types of assessments. I'm gonna go through some different types of assessments, but there are certainly, um, lots of home safety checklists that are available, and I'm gonna give you some examples of those that anyone can do. They can just go through the checklist, walk through the, the home, look for things, see if these hazards exist, or are there changes that they could make. Um, there are more complicated assessments that a service provider or therapist might do. Um, if you're getting into actually making some structural changes, you're probably going to want an assessment from those people who who design spaces and build in those spaces. Um, so they may have measurements and other kinds of assessments that they need to take. And it might be a team approach where all, all of these people are working together and sharing the information that they've gathered to make a, a comprehensive plan. So the types of assessments that I'd like to talk about today um, first are self-report and checklist. So these would be things where somebody's just kind of describing what's going on in their in their own space or the spaces that they're evaluating. And these checklists can be these nice guides um, to to kind of walk through each of the rooms and say, yes, this is there, or no, this is not. And interview and observation um, may, may be with a professional as well as performance and functional assessments and and again, as an occupational therapist, I'm interested in the things that people do in their everyday life. So sometimes I wanna see what that looks like. What does it look like when you get in and out of the bathtub? Or what does it look like when you get in and out of bed? Or what does it look like when you go to cook a meal? Um, and, and that kind of information can tell me where, where it's difficult or what the concerns might be. So, checklists and these are really just like they sound they're a list of items and you're really looking to see if those items are in place or not in place so uh, some of the advantages is that um, you know anybody that can read the checklist can basically fill it out um, if, if they're able to kind of see what's going on um, they often include recommendations so within the questions a lot of times it will say for instance, do you have grab bars, yes or no? So that might be a clue that that would be a good thing to have. Or are there handrails on both sides of the stairs? So there's, there's embedded within those questions, there are some ideas about um, safety features that you might wanna have in place so that when you recognize that they're not in place, you're able to maybe think about if that's a change that you would like to make. Um, these checklists also, can be used as a quick screening. And as a professional, I really like to engage families in thinking about the home and what's safe or what's problematic. 
um, in in their homes, so so that they kind of have an understanding, and it's not just a professional sort of coming in and telling you what what needs to change. And that doesn't work very well, particularly when you get to making changes in the home. Um, it's it's a reflection of of someone's life. Their home is kind of an extension of them, and so uh, people really need to be invested in making those changes. And sometimes when they're able to be part of the identification of the things that aren't working for them anymore, then they're more invested in considering alternatives. So some of the maybe disadvantages of a checklist is um, the, these are not really um, well researched. Uh, most of these these tools were somebody made them up. Um, sometimes they include expert panels who might say, well, we think these are the common hazards. Um, but we don't actually know if those are really the things that, that cause the most problems in the home. So it has some limited use in, in that. So it's, it's more of expert opinion that we think these are the, the things that are problematic. And another thing is that these checklists tend to focus on the hazards. What are the hazards or potential hazards in the home? But it doesn't tell us a lot about how people use their home. So for instance, it may say, do you have grab bars, yes or no? But it doesn't say whether or not you're using the grab bars or whether the placement of the grab bars is in a good place that makes them really functional and useful for you. So um, that information sometimes has to come from, from seeing it or from other, other methods. So I've, I've given some examples here and some links. Um, and I, I'll, I'm just going to pull one up really quickly here. Um, they're a little, little different. So the Alzheimer's Association actually has a home safety checklist, and they look at things um, not just in the physical environment, but things that could really be problematic, like um, sharp objects, um, accessing cleaning products. Because with, with dementia, sometimes um, the ability to, to uh, recognize what objects are can be challenging. Um, sometimes knowing what to do with objects can be challenging, and we don't want somebody to accidentally get poisoned or get burned or those kinds of things. So um, some of these are different on the Alzheimer's Association checklist than maybe some of the other home safety checklists that are more physically oriented. Um, although they think, have similar things like tripping hazards, throw rugs, extension cords, um, those are on a lot of these checklists as well. So just to kind of give you an idea, um, that's home safety checklist there. All right. Um, and feel free to check out these other links. If I get back there. Okay. Yep. Another method that we use then is performance measures. So this is where we we have somebody do something. And um, a, a care partner could do this, but you're probably, you probably already are engaged um, in, in seeing how people, the person that you're caring for is moving around or doing things. Um, you may not be looking for the same things that a professional is looking for, but you can certainly see how a person is transferring or moving around or what they're doing when they're cooking or what they're doing when they're um, eating or those kinds of activities that they might typically do, what dressing looks like. More formal measures um, of performance might have some studies behind them that say this actually is a good measure for, for a particular purpose. And um, one example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some examples of some of these measures in a minute, but one of them well, a formal measure is called the timed up and go, and this may have been performed. Um, you may not even know it, but it's a it's a rather quick measure, and it's very predictive of fall risk. And so it it's a measure where someone's sitting in a chair, they're asked to stand up, walk several feet, turn around, walk back, and sit back down. Um, and so that would be an example of of a formal measure that's predictive of fall risk that can um, be performed. It's not the same as somebody doing an activity. It's just sort of a movement measure, but um, that's, that's kind of an example. 
again, these measures may be more focused on what a person is doing and less about the context in which it's happening or the environment. It might not take into effect that that interaction between the person and the environment. So um, there there may be other factors that affect how a person's performing. So I talked about the timed up and go. Um, the physical performance test is looking at, again, physical things going on with a person. And a kitchen task assessment looks at um, how a person performs in the kitchen. It's a subset of a, a bigger test called the executive function performance test, which looks at those cognitive skills um, that tend to go first with dementia. So those that executive function focuses on um, those complex tasks that require sequencing and um, attention to, to multiple things. So if you think about cooking, you have to you have to do it in a certain order to get the right end product, and you have to be able to to prepare things and cook and um, know how to operate the equipment in the kitchen and be safe about it. So it requires a lot of complex thinking, and so um, that kitchen task assessment it it results in a formal score and it kind of gives an indication of how well a person is is managing not only physically but those cognitive demands of a high demand task like cooking. So in addition to checklists and performance-based measures, um, professionals may also interview and sort of analyze what's going on, observe what's happening, um, and those interviews are only as good as the information that they glean from families, really. Some professionals are, are really good and skilled at interviews. Um, others will ask really basic information. Um, and it, it really depends on that rapport that's built between families and a professional as well in terms of how much you're willing to share with somebody that you trust. Um, but that's where you may get at what's really going on between uh, the person and the environment. What, what's that interaction? What does that look like? What's the complexity of that? And that's how we get to more tailored, individualized um, interventions. So um, that can be time consuming. That can take some skill in terms of the professional um, and another thing to consider is a team approach. And so having multiple professionals with different perspectives coming at an issue um, sometimes yields even, even better intervention options because you have different people thinking about different things. And the same thing I would say about a team of family members. There are different family members that, that interact at different levels. And so they also bring different perspectives. Um, and while managing lots of people <laughs> to come to a single solution can be challenging, sometimes having those discussions with, from those broad perspectives um, is, is really helpful to, to finding a long-term solution that's, that's addressing not only the immediate need, but things that you're anticipating in the future. All right. So now I'd like to get back to some pictures. Um, and I, I think this, this helps to understand kind of what's going on. So um, this was a home that I went to, and I was just curious. They, they, this couple that lived here had these two microwaves. Um, there's a lot of steps to operating microwave. I don't know if you've really thought about the microwave very much. Microwaves are pretty important to people that are heating up things, or um, this might be more simplistic cooking. So if you're not, you know, getting out pots and pans and cooking on the stove, you might be using a microwave um, to heat up meals and do simple meal prep. And so that's probably a pretty important tool in the kitchen. Um, so I just want us to think about these two microwaves. I'm going to tell you some about the features of this. And have you tell me which one you think this um, family might be using. So this is microwave A. Um, so it's older. They've had it a while. 
it has fewer buttons and fewer functions and a lower wattage. Um, and when I think about just this picture, the numbers um, are, are pretty easy to see. Um, it doesn't really have a whole lot of, you know, options. Um, and, you know, some of the newer microwaves have a lot more options that may you, maybe you don't have to push a number, you can push something else. But um, it might be something that they're familiar with. It has a handle, which intuitively we would think you would grab the handle and pull it open to open the door. So those are some things to think about with this microwave A. And here's B. It's got pretty good contrast to be able to see the numbers again. It's got a lot of buttons. Um, it's got a greater wattage. Um, and it was received as a gift. And I think this happens, you know, families sometimes are like, what can I get? What can I get them that would be helpful? And I know they use the microwave a lot. And so maybe this is a good gift. And, and this, this was what they, you know, they knew that the microwave was older and they just picked up a new one. So um, if you also notice, there's a button underneath all the, the options and you would have to push that in, um, which, I think when we think of opening a door, it's not as intuitive to push in when you're trying to get something to open. So um, I love real life. This was not staged. So I asked them if I could open the microwaves. And inside microwave A was their lunch that was going to be warmed up as soon as I left. And inside microwave B was a collection of mail and papers and stuff um, because they didn't want, you know, their family to be disappointed they weren't using it, so they didn't want to really get rid of it, but it wasn't working. It was too complicated, and the, the wattage actually um, was too much for the outlet, and so it would short out, um, which is another issue, um, and a potential safety problem. So uh, here's something you, you might not think about. It's, it seems um, kind of silly, but it's actually a good example of thinking about how people are using their environment. So here is the story. The family gave them the new one, the older ones, what they used. The lower watts didn't blow a fuse. Um, it had fewer buttons, and they were less likely to have a problem with it. And they were not really cooking. They were heating up stuff that somebody else made. So they really needed it to work for them. So now I want to talk about what are some of the commonly demanding, I call these demanding features in the home. Other people might call these areas with, with safety issues. Um, so most common are that the bathroom is certainly an area with a lot of hazards. Um, but also moving around the house can be really challenging. Um, so inside steps, entrances with steps, steps can be really challenging as well. So again, I like to show some pictures about steps. And here's in this first picture with these two ladies again, uh, we see there's a grab bar just inside the door. And this was probably put there because that was a solid place on the on the door frame there with that they knew the grab bar wasn't going to pull out uh, and she is using it but that may not be optimal if you think about how she's positioned um, her hips are kind of back she's kind of swinging herself forward um, there's not anything in front of her to stop her really so if she starts you know if she swings around that corner she could I don't know run into the wall or something like that so again um, a good idea, but maybe not optimal. And you can see this gentleman, he is on some steps. They're not necessarily very deep, but there doesn't appear to be any handrail there. Um, so you can see, even if his skills and abilities don't change, but we just simply change the environment, he starts to look a whole lot safer than he was just a few minutes ago. Um, and and this is what I think is so important about the environment is the person, nothing about the person has to change, but if we can make that environment more supportive, we can really make people safer. 
getting around inside the house. Um, this is this picture kind of illustrates what we call a control center, and this happens a lot when people start to limit their movement within the house, and they spend most of their time maybe in one area, and they gather a bunch of belongings that are important to their day. So this gentleman has a phone and a cup of something to drink and the book and a stereo and a lamp and um, oftentimes people have a remote control of the TV. Um, he has a heating pad there with some cords. Uh, the cords maybe create, start to create a trip hazard. Um, you know, if he spills his drink, then what's going to happen? So uh, it's important to have a space where people can put their belongings. Um, but what does that clutter and that organization of that look like? Sometimes people will have their medications there. Um, and as we have some of this cognitive decline, figuring out how to sift through visually all of those items can, can be tasking and figuring out what's there and what do I need and what do I need to do with it. Um, and then this related to the getting around, then just are you safe to, to move around with all those cords and things like that? Getting up out of a chair, are there hand um, are there armrests on the chair to be able to get out of get up out of that chair? So some of the things that we might look at is is making sure that people have a clear path when moving through their house, that there's adequate lighting, that if they're using a mobility device like a cane or a walker, that it's adjusted to the right height for them, that it's positioned right, that they know how to use the device correctly, um, if they need verbal cueing from, from a care partner, that that care partner understands what that positioning should look like with that device. And I guess I didn't have a picture of steps here, but I did mention, mention stairs there, and we did talk about that before. So the in, inside steps can have some of the same issues as, as outdoor steps as well, and um, making sure you have handrails is important. And <coughs> in the homes, a lot of times we'll, we'll have, we might have wood steps, we may have carpeted steps, um, and the density of that carpet can create a trip hazard as well. With steps in particular, I like to talk about um, if, if, if we're doing something and there's a distraction or some noise or something that diverts our vision, what we're really dependent on our vision to keep us upright. And um, if the doorbell rings or something happens and we turn our head while we're going up steps, it's very disorienting. Um, and so I might say to people, if you're going up the steps and the doorbell rings, just wait till you get to the top or wait till you get to the bottom and try not to try not to divert your attention. Um, but that, that can be challenging at times. <clears throat> so bathing, the bathroom, there's you know lots of potential for hazards there. Um, so this is one of those examples where I could just look at the bathroom. I could come through with my checklist and say, you know, are there grab bars, yes or no? Um, but asking the person, to show me how you get in and out. Show me how you get in. Um, tells more of the story. So here... You can see he's going to have to step over the edge of the tub, but how, the objects that he's using for grab bars right now are not grab bars, and they're they're not all that safe. They're really likely to come out of the wall. Um, the other issue is he has to get turned around, so he's actually um, getting in that way because that that is where there are objects he can grab onto, but it puts him facing backwards from where the controls are for the tub, so then he still has to turn around and, and, and face the other direction. So we might have a recommendation to say, well, you know, maybe a bathtub is not so great. We, a shower might be better, so we could add a handheld shower. We could add a seat then we're also going to have to add a shower curtain, a, you know, a rod and a shower curtain. So the water, where's the water going to go? This isn't really built as a shower. So 
um, you really have to think through all of the pieces um, to convert a bathtub to a shower. Um, you know, they could take the tub completely out and just insert a shower too. That's another option. But um, sometimes we start adding equipment and we really have to think through the whole process of what's going to make it safe. So not only the transfer, but um, the, the surrounding area and how do we keep the water contained. Some other um, adaptations, I guess. So there are different types of grab bars. So there's kind of an example of, of one on the side of the tub. That's probably not optimal, but that might be an option for some people. Um, a lot of times we really like them to be wall mounted and in the studs of the wall so that they're not pulling out. Um, having a place to sit, and there are different options, chairs and benches. There are tub benches that go across the, the um, tub and you can sit down before you even get into the tub and slide across. Uh, there are more expensive options if people really want to take a bath. There are lifts that are that look like a chair that you sit in in the tub and then it lowers the person down. Um, and curbless showers are also a more expensive option. This gentleman that's seated in the shower there, you can see they they built um, that tiled floor and there's there's no step up into it. So. Um, those can tend to be more custom built and, and they can be more costly. And then considering non-skid services, whether that's just um, putting some kind of mat or uh, something in the bottom of the tub or having special tile in the bottom of the shower that helps to keep from slipping. So when we think about um, using the toilet and that part, again, you know, we don't want the floor to be wet in the bathrooms. So you may have to think about that. I know a lot of the home safety checklists talk about removing throw rugs, but you kind of have to, in the bathroom, you have to think about that. Um, you know, is the throw rug in the bathroom to absorb the water so you don't fall? You may want to keep that one in place instead of uh, removing that, that particular kind of throw rug. So kind of have to think about that. Um, the toilet height, there are these toilets now that are considered ADA toilets, the Americans with Disabilities Act. So in public spaces, there's this um, expectation that toilets are, are higher. Um, and the idea there is that it may be easier to get on and off a toilet if you don't have to squat down as far. But you have to consider the height of a person and not everybody is, is um, super tall, so there may be people that are shorter and that's not going to be helpful for them. It's going to make it even more difficult for them to use the toilet. So really think about that individualization in a home. Um, and then where's the, where's the toilet paper? How far away is that? And how far are people having to reach? And is that going to put them at risk of falling off the toilet? Now when you have um, some cognitive decline that, that comes with dementia, we might not want to make a whole lot of changes. Um, even if there are some of these things that might, you know, they might be improved if we move things. Sometimes moving things makes it more confusing for the person. They can get um, more upset by that. Um, when they're used to something, when it's, when it's a habitual pattern or way of, of moving through the environment that they're used to, we, we really have to think about where they are in the progression of the dementia and if that change is going to really support them or if it's going to be more disturbing to them. So um, there's some additional things to think about with dementia. In this particular bathroom, there's not much of a countertop. And, you know, and the sink there appears to be very cleared off. Um, there may be things that we do as visual cues in the environment, like if we want someone to brush their teeth you may want the toothpaste and the toothbrush to be visible on the on the counter. And maybe that's a prompt to them, oh, okay, these things go together. We also don't want too many things out because then it gets confusing about what all of these objects might be used for or, or what am I supposed to do with them. Um, so finding that balance of 
is this a cue that's going to help somebody to know what to do, or is this just clutter that makes it more demanding to sort through and figure out? Um, these are just some grab bar options and the raised toilet option. So um, I I like to insert this. I've kind of gone through the different major areas of the home that can be problematic, but I like I like to remind people that um, home and objects really have a lot of meaning for people, and even making a change to something like a toilet can can be a really big deal. Um, that the way that people engage with their home environment is is an extension of themselves. And in those early stages of dementia, when you know that there are changes occurring and you're trying to compensate for them and you're trying to, to keep up with everything, it can be really hard to, to say, okay, yeah, I'm gonna let you make all these changes in, in my house. Um, and, and so it really has to be a team effort to figure out this is gonna be in the best interest long-term and um, how, how can everybody be engaged in the decision-making process? Um, and how can we keep objects in place that really define a person and are part of their identity? And I like to talk about my grandmother here. Um, my grandmother, what I, I saw her, she, one of the roles that was really central to her life was a hostess. She she was the one who had the big Thanksgiving dinners and all the family came and we came from different states and everyone was there and she cooked lots of food. And um, she was the one who had bridge parties and all her friends over and, and uh, cookies and coffee with ladies groups and all kinds of hosting events. She had this huge dining room table and this china hutch and um, these were central. These were major objects that were so important to her. And I watched her move through the continuum of, of care that, that we have, uh, where she went from living in a single family home with her husband, and he, my grandfather passed away, and my grandmother was alone and isolated um, and was losing that sense of that huge role of of her social networks because she was no longer a couple. Um, and she was starting to, to have some of those early dementia um, symptoms. So, so it was harder for her to keep up with some of the things that she had been able to do. And she moved to independent living then. So it was an apartment in a complex with other older people. So she was socially engaged again and, and getting involved, but it was more manageable because the space was smaller and they had options for uh, group meals instead of her having to cook, although she had a kitchen space and she could cook. And when she moved to that space, she brought her dining room table without all the leaf inserts and her china hutch, and it was central to who she was. And... Um, when she started to have some balance issues and frequent falls and was starting to decline, she moved to assisted living. And in assisted living, it's smaller. The spaces are smaller and the care starts to increase. And so there were more people monitoring her and making sure she was safe, um, helping with medications. She still had a social network though. There were people around and she was involved in activities. And she was still able to bring her dining room table. She wasn't able to bring her china hutch at that point. And she didn't cook anymore. But instead of having um, a big family dinner, um, my mother would would bring food over. And we would have a smaller, um, more intimate kind of dinner with just family that lived locally. And my grandmother was the host. It was in her home. It was on her dining room table. But it was scaled back to a level that was manageable for her, which was it's my house and it's my table. And even though she wasn't cooking, that was that was okay. It was still feeding into that role as a hostess. And then 
she further declined and she moved to skilled nursing. In skilled nursing, she was sharing a room with somebody. Um, there's no space for a dining room table. That's gone. Um, what she did have was an end table next to her bed. <clears throat> and on that end table, um, her one of her sons who lived out of town, almost every holiday would send her a box of chocolates. And that box of chocolates would sit on that end table and she would offer it to every staff person, every visitor, every family member who came. And she was continuing to be that hostess at the level that she could do it in that setting. And when the dementia continued to decline and she wasn't able to verbalize and wasn't able to describe the meaning of that role any longer, um, not everyone understood how important that role was to her. And I remember she was getting really agitated one day. She was going to go go out. Um, I think we were, we were going to take, my mom was going to take her out, I don't know, out to dinner or out to lunch or something like that. And she was really agitated and she really wanted my mother to take a piece of candy. And my mom's like, no, no, we're going out to eat. And And I said to my mom, I said, just take the piece of candy. And that dissipated that um, that kind of agitation that my grandmother had because she got to be the hostess and she got to give something to someone else before she received going out or doing something else. So these are the, I tell you this story because that interaction between a person and their environment is so critical and understanding who a person is and having them be able to, to continue to maintain those roles, whatever that looks like and however scaled down that becomes is is really so important. And while we have these great checklists that help us understand some of the safety issues and those things, it's really the people that are closest to to the person with dementia that are going to understand best and 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 know that. And sometimes you just need a different perspective to remind you um, who that person is and why certain things are important to them. So I'm going to leave you with that, and um, I, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Okay, give me just one moment. Thank you so much, Dory. This was wonderful. So, Thank you. Um, we are we have the opportunity to ask questions for our participants. You can type them in as you'll you still remain in listen only mode. You can type them in on that right hand side portal where it says questions. Um, and we're happy to go ahead and moderate that discussion as, as we, um, you know, any other remaining questions that you have here. So as you're, as you're typing, um, I do have a question for you, Dory. Yes. Um, yes. I, I was wondering, uh, is there, if you've got someone who lives perhaps in a more rural area where uh, assessment and um, kind of a renovation, so to speak. That's not the right word, but a renovation is not easily accessible. What can, uh -huh. what can we do? How can I access that in a more remote or rural area? Renovations? Well, um, uh, adjustments. <laughs> home, yeah, home adjustments, things along yeah. those lines. Um, well, I will say there's increasing opportunities for, for telehealth, um, and that may be one way in which you could at least get a home assessment. Um, is is through a telehealth means where where maybe um, somebody who has a smartphone or computer or something like that could could walk through the home with a professional on the other end who who could kind of um, conduct an assessment from a distance to give okay. you some ideas of of the things. But in terms of of remodeling and renovations, um, you know some some of that may be may be challenging. Uh, I know. You know, sometimes, like in the instance of building a ramp or something like that, um, communities pull together, or family members, or there might be a handyman or somebody like that. Sure. But in terms of, you know, rebuilding a room or or reconfiguring um, things that that may require some Absolutely. kind of contractor that that that's working in that area, I would I would think. But there's also a lot of of things that you can do that are not major remodels and major renovations. Um, and really simplifying the environment is really one of the most important things you can do. And 
we, we, we kind of get used to having clutter. And I don't mean like, you know, stacks of stuff everywhere, but even just surfaces, just like a tabletop where you have maybe your dining room table and you have your medicine out there and you have a salt and pepper shaker and you have a tablecloth and you have, you know, that's clutter. That's mm-hmm. hard for a person to filter through and go, what am I supposed to pay attention to on this table? And so some of what you can do is just strip things down, just minimize things. When you're eating, then maybe the only thing that needs to be on the table is the plate that it's on and the utensil you're using. You know, those are simple things that anybody can do in in rural or urban or Excellent. anywhere in between. Great. Thank you so much. So we have a few other questions, uh, Dory. First of all, I I see Tatiana, thank you so much. We've got two questions from you. You're mentioning emailing a copy of the presentation uh, in case we forgot to mention it earlier on the right-hand side portal at the bottom, you see a section that says handouts and the presentation as well as a few other supplemental handouts are all listed there for download. Um, It's a PDF attached. So you can go ahead and download that right during the the webinar today. So that should be helpful for you. And within that handout, there there are some links to those checklists. I showed you the one from the Alzheimer's Association, but there's also a couple others in there. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, The next question is about rental properties. Great question here. Uh, For rental properties, is the landlord required by the ADA to allow a tenant to install grab bars? Great question. Yes, great question. Actually, it's under the Fair Housing Act. So the Fair Housing Act um, is an anti-discrimination legislation um, so so that persons with disabilities um, can make changes to to the space that they're renting. it, it requires the person who's living in the space to disclose to the landlord that they have a disability. They have to disclose what kind of uh, um, changes you want to make. So if you want to add grab bars, um, and then you you are required to pay for the cost to install those, as well as the cost to return the space back to its original, um, it, it, how it looked originally, um, so all of that is on the person living in the space. So the landlord doesn't pay for any of that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I'm sure that that's probably a hot question in, in more metropolitan areas where you've got a lot more rentals happening. Uh, so the next question comes from Kyle. Uh, any tricks to talking them into removing clutter? <laughs> Another great question, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, Sometimes I talk about, um, well, there's there's um, a model called the health belief model, and it's it's how we get people to change health behaviors. And I think kind of that can be applied in this setting too, um, trying to get people to make changes to their home environment. But um, there, there's one model that, that I like in particular, and it talks about a person has to first – believe that the changes you're recommending are going to make a difference. Like Mm -hmm. um, they they have to believe that they also have to believe that there is a perceived risk that if, if I don't do this, there's going to be a problem and the problem is going to be big. So, Mm -hmm. so if someone is already recognizing that they're, they're having falls or that, you know, there's some kind of safety concern and that that's going to, maybe land them in a nursing home instead of being able to live at home. Um, sometimes that fear can can make them more acceptable of these changes, but they also have to believe that these changes are, are going to work and that they can, they can afford to do it. So, if, so clutter is one that you can afford to do, obviously, but they, there has to be some belief that this clutter is going to then keep you out of the nursing sure. home if that's what you're afraid of. Does, does sure. that kind of help? <laughs> um, yeah, no, that makes a lot of Not sense. Not that we want to scare people, but I think sometimes letting them know the reality, like maybe decreasing the clutter isn't such a big deal if it's going to keep you from this other thing that you really don't want to have happen, whether that's ending up in the hospital because you broke your hip or or going to a nursing home or whatever that thing is that they're afraid of. Sure. So, I mean, it's finding the motivation for that individual that we're working with 
and finding yeah. out what, what's going to be the best thing to help them achieve their goals as well as keep them safe. Thank you so much. And Kyle says a big thank you as well. Um, again, for those of you who may have missed, the handouts are on the right-hand side. In the section that says handouts, there's a drop-down. Uh, PDF version can be uh, downloaded as well as a few other materials. Uh, we have a, another question here. Can any, and this comes from someone in our offices, can any equipment uh, or remodeling be covered by Medicare? Um, I, I'm going to say no right now. Medicare is really changing, and I I just saw an article um, that came out last week, the week before, where Medicare is going to start allowing for groceries. So I don't know what this new legislation looks like. I don't know what provisions are going to be under it. So um, so I'm going to say it hasn't been the case that that's been included, but oh, I yeah. think there, the, some of these, these Medicare Advantage programs are trying a lot of new things right now, and they're paying for things like gym memberships, and they're paying for things like chronic disease management and they're and now I guess they're going to pay for you know if people are engaging in other health things um, so I don't know what the extent to which they're going to pay for in the near future is, is going to be um, but as of as of now I'm not aware of uh, of that then I know there may be under Medicaid there may be some Medicaid waiver programs Got that it. that that might have provisions for that. And that varies by state. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, and it's, you'd have to know what the Medicaid waiver programs are in your state and if the person qualified for, for Medicaid. But um, as far Excellent. as I know right now, Medicare does, does not. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, it, is, another, it may be changing. <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's a suggestion, and, and, and thanks again, Stephanie. Uh, calling your local area agencies on aging in your state can certainly help you find out what's available um, where you are for our, our That's national. That's a great resource. The, the area agency on aging, um, the aging and disability resource centers is another good resource. Um, your local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. All, all of those. Absolutely. And you can always call us here at the Alzheimer's Foundation. Our national toll-free helpline is happy to help you find these resources and answers in your area as well. So uh, that's 866-232-8484. And uh, our social workers are always available to help answer any of these questions that you may have. Uh, so there's a, there's a question about these um the, the checklist that you saw and those, uh, although they're not downloaded on the handout section, you can find those on the websites that are listed in the PowerPoint. So certainly yeah. feel free to, uh, to take a look at that. Any of these home assessment safety checklists can all be found on the websites that, that we have listed here on the, the PowerPoint. So, um, and then if you have any other questions and you're not sure and you can't find it, you can always email uh, Dory, or you can email us, and we're happy to get in touch with you. Um, Dory, do you mind sending it to the next slide? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry. That has Yay. that just has some, some important numbers and there's some like great that. resources. Excellent. Yeah. So there are some other um, resources. So we've got another question uh, from Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Uh, looking to see if design and remodel companies are uh, have a CAP or UDCP designers that can help as well. They are familiar with design options, costs, and local organizations that can help. That's a great resource, finding design companies that are familiar with doing these modifications that have these particular um, credentials. Yes. So, so CAPS is Certified Aging in Place Specialist, and that is through the National Home Builders Association. So if you go to the, the um, NAHB website, they're, they have a directory, and you can find if someone has this CAPS designation um, in your area. It, it, there's a directory of the people who've done this. Some of them are occupational therapists. Some of them are builders. Um, it, it's a wide variety of people that have actually gotten that. Um, and I don't know what the other acronym you said, but I'm guessing it's something related to universal design. Excellent. The and then... And then <laughs> Uh, Catherine is also mentioning, thank you again for all these resources, Catherine. NARI, N-A-R-I, is a great place as well. 
Um, and so that's another great resource for, for you if you're looking for other resources. But certainly, uh, you know, I think what, what we're hearing a lot of here uh, as, we, as we head towards the end of the presentation is that there's resources out there and if you can't find them, we can help you find them. We can get you back in touch with Dory and she can help you find them. Uh, we really want to make sure that the seniors that we're living with or are, are, are working with are safe um, and feel comfortable and where they're living and able to have a quality of life and meaning in their life day to day. So we want to uh, thank you. Just another moment for any questions. If anybody has any last minute questions. Um, and while we're waiting for any of those last minute questions, I just want to let you all know again that AFA's National Toll Free Helpline is now seven days a week. Uh, 9 to 9 Monday through Friday, and that's Eastern Time, 9 to 1 Saturday and Sunday, and that's always a licensed social worker on the line. So we do hope that you'll give us a call with any questions that you may have. Uh, we haven't had a, we haven't been stumped yet, and so, uh, you know, certainly give us a call and, 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 and test our, test our knowledge. We have uh, our Educating America tour that's going on as we speak, 16 different conferences around the country. So we'll be in Nashville tomorrow and Charleston next week. Uh, we'll be in New York City uh, in, in May 18th for those of you who are local with us here. Uh, and all of the other information about that is, uh, is on the drop down uh, handouts as well as on our website, which is listed right here on the screen. So hopefully you can come join us in a city near you. Uh, we have another special edition webinar next uh, next week. So this month is Occupational Therapy Month. So happy Occupational Therapy Month uh, to you, Dory, and all the other occupational Thank therapists you. on the line. Uh, and it's also Safe Driving Month. So next week we're going to have a webinar, uh, same one to two times during on the Thursday, April the 19th, on when to put the brakes on your loved one's driving. Hot topics always. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're getting some comments about the OTs. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Stephanie, for the <laughs> reminder. May 1st, we're going to be in Alabama. So certainly come and uh, visit our friends like Stephanie and AFA in Alabama on May 1st for our Educating America tour. Um, and then for our local friends here in New York, we also have free programming for community members in our Education and Resource Center uh, with a jazz concert next week. So we're excited. Uh, we're excited about that. Uh, any other questions? Just some celebrations of our occupational therapists. We love all the great work that you're doing and want to thank uh, Dory for this fantastic webinar, really educational. We do appreciate your time and your knowledge today to help out our care community. Uh, for those of you who may have missed this webinar um, or you want to tell your friends about it, this will be uh, uploaded on our website within the next day or two with the rest of our Care Connection webinars. And hopefully we'll see you again next week in our Driving Safe uh, webinar. So thank you so much, Dory. Uh, thank you to everybody on the line. We'll be ending uh, this webinar in just a few moments. Thank you again, Dory. Thank you.